Next tonight, David Souter's second day of testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is considering his nomination to the Supreme Court. Roger Mudd has our extended report. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back. Thank you, sir. Compared to what the committee went through with the Robert Bork nomination three years ago, this hearing seems more like a mutual admiration society. The morning papers, of course, uh, kind of confirm how well you did yesterday. And if they they any... make me very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's any one thing that a politician in this town respects, if not, in fact, envies, of course, it's very good press. So you've passed a very important test. Make no mistake about it, David Souter is getting good reviews because he and his staff have learned from the Bork hearings. They watched the Bork tapes last summer, and this is what they learned. Answer the question without rephrasing the question. Never play games with words, show some heart, and never forget that the Senate hearing room is really a TV studio. That remains. And, and when the questioning began I today with Senator Grassley, a fifth suitor rule emerged. Lecture. Give so away as little as possible. Think? Judge Souter, those who advocate a greater activist role for the courts say that the broad and spacious terms of the Constitution lend themselves to court-made solutions when the political branches fail to act. What is your sense of this perception that the courts, rather than the elected branches, should take the lead in creating a more just society? I think the proper way to approach that is that courts must accept their own responsibility uh, for making a just society. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is a, almost a, a fact or, or a law of nature as well as a law of constitutional growth is that uh, if there is in fact a profound social problem, if the Constitution speaks to that, uh, and if the other branches of government do not deal with it, ultimately it does and must land uh, before the bench of the judiciary. If, in fact, the Congress uh, will, will face the responsibility that goes with its 14th Amendment power, then by definition there is to that extent going to, not going to be a kind of vacuum of responsibility created uh, in which the courts are going to be forced uh, to, to take on problems which sometimes in the first instance might better be addressed by the political branches of the government. Uh, there, I guess the law of nature that I'm referring to is, is, uh, is simply the law that nature uh, and political responsibility, uh, constitutional responsibility, abhor a vacuum. Um, I've, I've spoken to this point before, and I, I think I alluded to it yesterday. Are you saying that the Supreme Court should act because there's a vacuum there, or because there's a cause uh, of the cons within the Constitution for the courts to act, as opposed to because the, the uh, political branches have not acted? The Supreme Court should only act, and can only act, uh, when it has the, the judicial responsibility uh, under the 14th Amendment or any other section of the Constitution. Uh, but the, the Supreme Court is left to act alone when the political branches do not act beforehand. Republican Senator Specter of Pennsylvania brought up the War Powers Act, but his specific question was whether Souter thought the Korean War, fought without a congressional declaration of war, was constitutional. I do think that in approaching the, uh, the Korean War question, uh, we have to face the fact that it was undoubtedly within the, uh, the power to commit troops to some degree, in some instance, without congressional approval, uh, that in fact uh, congressional support was, uh, was expressed throughout that period by, by congressional appropriation uh, and by the, the authorization which Congress thereby uh, expressed. And it's difficult for me to see uh, uh, although I will rethink this when, when, when I have some time to be quiet, it's difficult to, for me to see how the combination of the President's power with that degree of, of approval and support from Congress uh, could raise a genuine issue of unconstitutionality for, that would be subject to adjudication. When you talk about appropriations, it isn't realistic for the Congress to stop appropriations at a time when a war is being fought. 
And if you follow through the logic of your last answer, if you take uh, that kind of implicit uh, approval, uh, then uh, we have read out of the Constitution the congressional authority to declare war. You make the assumption that Congress never has a, a funding option. Uh, not being a member of Congress, I, I can't second guess you on that, but that is a, that is a position you never has an option once the troops are, are committed and engaged. Uh, that, is a, uh, that is an assumption that I would be loath to make. And finally, the case no one seems able to avoid, Roe versus Wade, establishing as constitutional the right to an abortion. Leading the questioning, certainly to the dismay of the White House, was not only a Republican, but a Republican from Judge Souter's home state, Gordon Humphrey. Judge, you were a member of the Board of Trustees of the Concord Hospital from 1971 to 1985. In 1973, the trustees voted to begin performing abortions in that hospital. Have you said for the record how you voted on that issue? I think I have, but uh, the, the, I voted for the resolution, and my recollection is that the specific terms of the resolution uh, uh, allowed uh, abortion consistent with what was then the new, uh, uh, the, the new legal uh, uh, era inaugurated in the terms of, of Roe v. Wade. Yeah. Uh, and if abortions are going to be performed, uh, as by law they could be performed, uh, it was appropriate in a non-sectarian hospital to allow the, the full range of, of backup services for the safety of the mother uh, and indeed for the, uh, uh, for the safety of all participants. Uh, and we felt, and I do now feel, the hospital had an obligation to do that. So you did not feel in that case that it was appropriate to bring to bear any moral judgment is that what you're saying? I did not. Is it fair to state, even though you're not prepared to discuss it, understandably, that you do have an opinion on Roe Wade? Uh, it, I, th I think it would be misleading to say that. Uh, I have not got any agenda on what should be done with Roe v. Wade if that case were brought before me. I will listen to both sides of that case. I have not made up my mind and I do not go on the court uh, saying I must go one way or I must go another way. After a lunch break and what must have been a strategy session, Judge Souter returned anxious to explain, especially to the TV audience, why he has been so unwilling to take a position on current cases. Is there anyone who has not at some point made up his mind on some subject and then later found reason to change or modify it? Uh, no one has failed to have that experience. No one has also failed to know that it is much easier to modify an opinion if one has not already stated it convincingly to someone else. And with that in mind, can you imagine the pressure that would be on a judge who had stated an opinion or seemed to have given a commitment in these circumstances to the Senate of the United States and for all practical purposes to the American people. You understand the compromise that would, that would place upon the judicial capacity. But that did not deter Democrat Kennedy from giving Souter a series of hard pushes on Roe versus Wade. Uh, as a matter of your own individual and personal moral beliefs, uh, do you believe that abortion is moral or immoral? Senator, I am going respectfully to ask to decline to, to answer that question for this reason, uh, that whether I do or do not find it moral or immoral uh, will play absolutely no role in any decision which I make if I am asked to make it uh, on the question uh, of what weight should or legitimately may be given uh, to the interest which is represented by the, uh, by the abortion decision what uh, you were willing to express about the morality in the application of the death penalty for individuals who had moral beliefs, and you're willing to express your own moral belief when it came to the questions of white-collar crime. Why can't you uh, share with us your view about whether it's moral or immoral, or perhaps moral in certain cases, and maybe immoral in other kinds of cases? Obviously, you've given a great deal of thought to this, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor responded to that question, Judge. 
With respect, uh, sir, I do not believe I could do so without creating the impression uh, that I could not give a, a, a fair hearing to people whose views might differ from mine on that. And uh, I, have, uh, I, I am not familiar with, with Justice O'Connor's uh, answer on that subject. Uh, it, may, it may have depended upon prior opinions that she had given. But what I do believe, Senator, is that for me in this forum to start uh, uh, in the most serious discussion, even with you, uh, to an expression of, of my views of the morality on that subject uh, would be taken by a substantial number of people uh, as the beginning of a commitment on my part to go in one direction or another. Such testimony caused both Planned Parenthood and the National Abortion Rights League, as expected, to announce this afternoon their opposition to the suitor nomination. The hearings resume on Monday.